This is KC Sports Network, proudly presented by M Prize Bank. Welcome into another Three Mall Pod. I am your host today, Cole Manbeck, no John Kurtz, uh, but joined as always by Derek Young as we recap Kansas State's dominating 41 to nothing victory over the Houston Cougars as K State advances to four and one in Big 12 play and six and two overall. As a reminder, as always, get stocked up with your holiday distillery products who support us. 360 Vodka, outstanding stuff. Ben Holiday Bottled in Bond Bourbon is a personal favorite of mine. Get stocked up for what should be a really exciting weekend heading into Monday as well. We got K-State basketball season tipping off on Monday uh, against top 25 ranked USC in a huge matchup that will be televised on TNT. We've got Patrick Gongba commitment coming this weekend on November 4th. We'll see if he chooses Kansas State coming off his official visit this weekend. It is between Duke, K-State, and Kentucky. And uh, we've got, obviously, a huge matchup in Austin as K-State 4-1 and going up against Texas 4-1 and in league play in a game that could put the winner um, at the forefront of the Big 12 title race to get back to Arlington for Kansas State. So, huge game Saturday, big noon game on Fox. Uh, get stocked up with your uh, Ben Holiday bottled in Bond Bourbon or 360 Vodka I did mention. No John today. I uh, did want to pass along our thoughts and condolences to the uh, the Kurtz family, Quentin, uh, John's father, um, as well as they, uh, John's grandfather, uh, Vernon Ray Kurtz, uh, passed away about a week ago and is being laid to rest today. So our condolences to uh, the Kurtz family as they're going through a difficult time there. Um, Vernon Ray Kurtz was a, a teacher at K-State for more than 30 years and a Manhattan resident. Um, so we, uh, we think we're thinking of John, Quentin, and uh, the entire Kurtz family right now. D.Y., uh, Another dominant victory for Kansas State. And I, I think John had mentioned after the TCU game, we need to show more love to the uh, the K-State defense on the next pod, and they're giving us a perfect time to do that. They, they shut out another opponent. So to me, that's the storyline. Um, wh- what did you make of that defensive effort and what we saw on Saturday? It felt like a lot like, like the TCU one, which nothing to take away from them. It's a really good defense, but like there's just – not a whole lot of splash or, or flair to it. They just stop you. That, that's what they do. They, I mean, they, they did force two turnovers, but they're not forcing a lot of turnovers. They're not making a lot of like, you know, crazy plays to where they're going to catch the eye of the average fan or the audience and say, man, this is a dominant defense, but you'll look up two or three hours later and be like, eh, this team still hasn't allowed a touchdown. And they have it in the last nine quarters. And in fact, not only that, um, in the nine last nine quarters, zero touchdowns, but also just three points total. And also, interestingly enough, maybe a little bit of a home and away thing here as well. Kansas State's defense is not allowed a touchdown at home since September 23rd. So they will not allow a touchdown in Bill Snyder Family Stadium for the entire month of October. And it's going to be going on uh, you know, close to two months by the time Kansas State does return to Manhattan after the Texas game. So that that's a pretty impressive statistic as well, but like it's different because they're just getting it done in a very ho-hum fashion. Not a, you know, that they affect the quarterback, maybe don't, don't get to him a whole lot. Again, I think what one sack on the day. So, and I think it was named Matlack. So you're getting a worthy and, you know, stellar contribution probably from upwards of 15 to 18 guys. But nothing's just flashy. They just take care of their business, very lunch pail type defense. It's very business like. I mean, you mentioned it. Yeah, it's, there's nothing flashy about what they're doing. They just find ways to get off the field. And over the last two games, so Houston goes three of 14 on third downs. TCU the week before goes two of 13 on yeah. third downs. I mean, they're, the last two opponents are five of 27 on and third at, downs. Not, and at the same time, I think Kansas State's combined 20 of 27. Yeah, I think, yeah, that, 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 that's right, actually, because at halftime of the Houston game over their last six quarters, they were 17-20 to 20 on third down conversions at 85%. And here's a, a key number, D.Y. K-State's defense now is number six in the country in third down defense, holding teams to 29%. They're behind Utah, Georgia, Texas, Penn State, and Oklahoma. K-State's offense, fourth in the country in third down offense, converting 55% behind LSU. Michigan and Georgia so been highly highly successful elite really at both third down offense and third down defense and another interesting number is now 
K-State opponents have attempted 22 fourth down attempts, which is the third highest in the country because the K-State defense and the offense keeps putting teams so far behind over the last few weeks that teams have to go for it on fourth yeah, downs. You know, I, 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 I actually, I don't know why this is, and I think it's the same way in the NFL, so it's not even an NFL college difference. But when you turn a team over on downs, I think that should be considered a turnover. Like, it's literally just the same. You're getting the ball at that spot. It, I think it should be considered a turnover. And in fact, in many cases, turning them over on downs, turning your opponent over on downs is better than getting an interception or a fumble because you're going to get better yardage out of it because you get the ball at that spot rather than, you know, whether it be, you know, a long throw downfield that you intercept. So I think that should be considered a turnover. So we're, maybe we're belly aching a little bit. This team doesn't, it's not like this team is forcing three, four turnovers a game, which is, you know, at times the last couple of years, it felt like that. But when you add in that, that you're turning, they like turn Houston over on downs four times. You add in the fact, then it's like you force six turnovers, really. Yeah. Last 25 drives for that K-State defense dating back to the second half of the Texas Tech game. So we're talking 10 quarters, nearly 10 quarters of football. They've allowed three points over 25 drives, forced 10 punts, six turnovers on downs. You mentioned it. Five interceptions, one fumble recovery, and then two drives at the end of the game where time expired and then a field goal uh, was converted as well by TCU. Those are the only three points over the last 25 drives. That comes out to uh, 0.12 points per drive allowed over a nearly 10-quarter stretch. And uh, K-State's defense now, D.Y., allowing 1.62 points per drive on the season. And this is a credit to uh, KSU underscore fan on Twitter, Jimmy, as uh, many of you probably follow him. He's got some great numbers out there uh, regarding Kansas State and the points per drive and all those advanced metrics. But they're now number three in the Big 12 overall on the season in points per drive allowed just behind Iowa State for number two in the league at 1.60 is Iowa State. K-State's 1.62. K-State's offense leads the Big 12 at 3.46 points per drive offensively. That's not, that's not very close anymore. No, no. So and, and they lead the Big 12 in touchdown rate at 46% offensively, scoring touchdowns, in other words, on 46% of her drives. So that's a credit to KSU underscore fan. And defensively, they're allowing a touchdown rate at 16%, which is just behind Texas for number two in the Big 12. So and in red zone, it's even better. The touchdown rate allowed, it's number two in the country, only behind Michigan. Um, touchdown rate in the red zone and I think going into the Houston game, it was 30%. Obviously, that didn't change because they didn't have to worry about that against Houston. Houston didn't get in the red zone one time. Um, second behind Michigan in that stat, though, uh, Michigan, 20% better than everybody else. Yep. Maybe stealing some signs in the red zone as well, so uh, knowing what's coming. The uh, the 1.62 points per drive, DUI, is the best of the Chris Kleiman era. So if the season ended today, the best that – a Chris Kleiman coach team at K-State had was 1.91 points per drive. That was in 2021. Here's where it's a little bit more staggering. If the season ended today, and keep in mind, they got to face two top 15 offenses in Kansas and Texas still. Texas is number 10 in ESPN's SP Plus rankings offensively. KU is number 13. So a couple of really tough tasks remain on the schedule. But if the season ended today, the 1.62 points per drive would be the highest since these were tracked by Brian Freemau dating back to 2007. So Brian Freemau's points per drive stats go all the way back to 2007. We're talking about 16, 17 years of data. The second best is 1.75 points per drive allowed by the K-State defense in 2012. So Joe Klanderman, Chris Kleiman, finding ways to uh, to get it done, defensive-minded. So uh, and, and I think, D.Y., the, the thing to underscore here and really – make note of is yeah Houston not a great team I think we all thought K-State would win this game handily and and like the spot that K-State was in you got to uh, get Houston at the right time even Chris Kleiman admitted that yeah but it's a good Houston offense I mean no, they were taught they're good yeah they're so. good and to be honest it's not I don't think Houston's in the bottom two though they're they're like they're better than Baylor at this point I would say they're they're better than uh maybe UCF and Cincinnati who can't get a win yeah, no, yeah. Since Hattie is a is a disaster. Yes, yes, pretty bad. I mean, they hung with Oklahoma, but they've been bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They are. I mean, it's oh, UCF still liked by the advanced metrics, so they are. Uh, Just can't win, but yeah, it's only that Cincinnati is hung around a lot of games too, and still can't win as well. Yeah. 
you have to remember Cincinnati. I mean, if Cincinnati was like 10% better in the red zone that day, that they would have had Oklahoma on the ropes, which probably goes back to the Sooners definitely being overrated. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but it was a Houston offense that ESPN's SP Plus had as the number 22 team in the country offensively. Donovan Smith had thrown for nearly 2,000 yards. DY, they, they hold Houston to 95 yards passing on 33 attempts, 2.9 yards per pass. Dana Holgerson has coached 158 games in his coaching career dating back to 2011 at West Virginia. The 95 yards passing, from what I found, is the second fewest by a Dana Holgerson coach team behind only 2013 against Maryland. They threw for 62 yards. It's the second time Dana Holgerson's been shut out. Also, 37 nothing loss to Maryland that 2013 season. So they had a disastrous day that day, but only the second time they've been shut out as a Dana Holgerson coach team over 158 games. Um, the 2.9 yards per pass, also the second fewest. And the three and a half yards per play that used to add against K-State is the second fewest in Dana Holgerson's 56 games as the head coach at Houston. Uh, behind only 3.4 yards per play against Texas Tech in 2021. And it, it ties for the third fewest yards per play in his coaching career over the span of 158 games. So just a uh, a dominant performance defensively. Maybe we talk about the secondary here in just a minute. But first, we're going to we're gonna toss to a break. And we're going to tell you about our friends at Home Field Apparel. As always, DY, I, I think you're probably rocking a... Uh, Another home field sweatshirt uh, this week. Oh, UI is going with the retro K State gear. He doesn't have the uh, the Ole Miss uh, retro gear or Ohio, but DY is a perfect example that if you want something other than K State as well, they've got everything you could want at Home Field Apparel. Uh, DY has rocked numerous different schools, including Arizona as well, and that cool cactus logo uh, this year. So he's got lots of awesome gear. Home Field has over 100 colleges to choose from. But they got a lot of K-State stuff, and I think a lot of you, that's what mostly you'd be interested in. They've got 40 K-State items at homefieldapparel.com for you to choose from. You can score 15% off with the code EMAW23 on your first-time order. So go to homefieldapparel.com, check out their gear. I'm also rocking a, a very comfortable home field hoodie. I can't tell you how comfortable this thing is. It's super soft and uh, feels great, especially now as we've got these uh, these winter temperatures that are approaching so super warm and uh, soft comfortable sleek retro logos if that's your style get stocked up for the rest of k-state football season and k-state hoop season score 15 percent off with code 3 ma 23 homefieldapparel.com thanks for listening to kc sports network make sure you download our new app find it on the app store or google play just search kc sports network So, D.Y., I want to talk just a, a little bit about the secondary as well because I talk, I mentioned they hold Houston to 95 yards passing, uh, which you don't see. You don't see many teams held that low. It's uh, it's also overall the seventh time since the start of the 2022 season that K-State has held an opponent to under 10 points. Five of those occurred against Big 12 teams. So defensively overall, uh, over the last 20 or so games, K-State's defense has been pretty darn solid. But the secondary... Uh, they've been playing really good football. I mentioned it, five interceptions. Jacob Parrish um, fully back into the swing of things after he missed that Oklahoma State game. Will Lee has a great game against Houston. He has an interception. He forces a fumble as well. But what what do you make of, of K-State's secondary and, and some of the guys that are getting the job done there? A lot of new parts. It took a while to come together, but the, that their, their growth – their improvement, their development over the last month is probably why this defense is playing as well as it is. I mean, and this the switch at safety between excuse me, VJ Payne and Kobe Savage. I so making that switch and and having those guys get a lot of reps together, get a lot of reps on the football field in general, because a lot of first time starters at Kansas State. I think that was important. I said, you know, I think it was probably about a month ago when they were going through some you know, struggles and some adversity that, you know, by the time that we get to the end of the season, it's probably going to be the most improved group. They didn't even take that long. So I I think this revelation from the Kansas State secondary is really likely the culprit uh, of this uh, drastic switch in improvement. It's interesting because I, I think it was John that posed a question for you and me on a show several weeks ago. Who gets it together first, K-State secondary or the K-State offensive line? And it kind of feels like it all happened at once. 
right? I mean, the, the K-State offensive line has been playing tremendous football, the running game, uh, and then uh, the defense, obviously, in the secondary playing great. And, I mean, it's again, it's a Houston offense. Over the previous four games, they were completing 73% of their passes. That was six best in the country during that time. They had 13 touchdowns to one interception over that span, 1,319 yards over the last four games on 157 passes, 8.4 yards per pass, and uh, they were eighth in the country over that time and pass efficiency offense and led the Big 12 over the past four games. So they'd really been throwing the ball well. Donovan Smith, a talented quarterback, but again, 2.9 yards per pass against K-State, 45% completion percentage. They could not get anything through going through the air. Donovan Smith has an 11.3 quarterback rating, a 65.7 passer rating, both season worst for the quarterback. And now K-State's pass efficiency defense, D.Y., they are 13th in the country and pass efficiency defense against FBS opponents. That's number one in the Big 12. A 113.5 rating, uh, fifth in the country over the last three games in pass efficiency defense, and the 113.5 pass efficiency rating would be the best of the Chris Kleiman era at the season of today. The second best was last year, a 126.7 in 2022, which ranked 45th in the country. Well, we went this long without talking about the K-State offense, D.Y., and I think a lot of us wondered what they would do at the quarterback position following the TCU game when both Avery Johnson and Will Howard alternated every series and and both played pretty well. This game, they, they start Will Howard again, and I don't think any of us were surprised by that, but uh, Will takes them right down. They score a touchdown, and this time, I think, and I think you had suggested this too on the last show, like if they go right down and score a touchdown, keep them on the field and, and see if they can do it again. And they did. And then they were up 14 to nothing uh, very quickly in this game as Will Howard led and commanded two touchdown drives. And then they brought Avery Johnson in on that third series. And unfortunately, on the second play, he's in uh, a fumbled exchange on a handoff. And uh, that was all we saw Avery for quite a while in the game. And Will came back in. But what, what did you make of how they handled the quarterback situation in this one? And any surprises? Yeah. I've seen the chatter out there, and I actually probably subscribe to a little bit that maybe you don't you go back to them after the turnover because you don't want to make either one of your core wrecks because they're because they're both watching, so you know fearful of a turnover and have that paranoia to, that they're playing with. That aside, and and I'm not going to pick nits too much with that, but I I do subscribe to that theory or at least understand that line of thinking. With that being said, it felt like the Texas Tech game maybe a little bit more drastic, but in reverse. And I I think that's what you got to do for the most part. Like the TCU stuff, the TCU plan or approach or, or how that worked out, I just don't think that's sustainable, nor do I think that it's likely to be repeated. I think most times, even if you want to give both quarterbacks a shot early in the game, I think most times you're going to have to see how they both do and then go from there, uh, pick the direction of where it's flowing, you know, who's who's got it going, who doesn't, what the game calls for, what it doesn't, and and make a decision based upon that. Look, two quarterback systems are really hard to navigate, really hard to maneuver, both from maybe a psychological standpoint when you're kind of playing with the mind a little bit of both quarterbacks that, you know, don't know what to expect, but also because it's, it's easy to screw up, not just that, from that standpoint, but – from a r- rhythm standpoint. And I don't think, and they've done this for what, three, four games now. I don't think they've made a, a colossal mistake yet. And that's easy to do. I think, you know, the buckaboo about two quarterback systems all the time and it usually rears its ugly face is that you really can harm the rhythm of your offense. And they've navigated it so that that hasn't been an issue. Now, hopefully they can sustain that. Um, in terms of making the right choice at the right time um, for the remainder of the year. But um, that's hard to do, and that's what they're succeeding at right now. Will Howard goes 15-17 to 17 through the air, 9.6 yards per pass, 164 yards overall, two touchdowns, no interceptions. Avery Johnson, 5-6 of six for 46 yards, 7.7 yards per pass, the one touchdown, no interceptions. Most of those 46 yards came on his last drive in the game. Do you? Th- I know we've talked that Avery Johnson is an extremely confident, mature kid. Not doesn't play like a true freshman. Not a true freshman 
in terms of his personality off the field, incredibly mature. But do you think there's some significance to him getting that touchdown pass at the end of the game, D.Y., and just ending the game with a feel-good moment? It's always better to feel a little bit better about yourself. Obviously, he's probably – he's even keeled, and it probably didn't have a whole lot of fluctuation there between before and after that touchdown. But human nature says there's at least a little bit. So I think that was a good thing to end on, even if it doesn't make it a drastic – you know, impact, in my opinion, just from knowing Avery Johnson, the kid. Um, I do think, and I know some, and I and I, I, and I actually agree with this, you got to get Avery Johnson as many reps as possible to continue to, to get him, you know, inundated with the offense and because you're going to need him. You're still going to need him the remainder of this year. But I thought they pulled him at the right time because it was a 41-0 to ball game and – what he was going to be able to glean in a last drive or two against Houston was going to be, you know, not much because at that point Houston didn't even have their first team defense. In. And I, I mean, at that point, DY, he's just going to be handing the ball off because I don't think any of us want him taking hits, you know, because no, they, want, they need him. Yeah. They need him. You don't want him getting hurt. And there's little, the, yeah, the risk reward there was not enough, um, especially with Houston not having their starters in the game. They made yeah. the right call in pulling him. And to me, that's just an acknowledgement by the coaching staff that they recognize, like, we, we don't want this guy taking any hits because we know we're going to need him the remaining four games plus postseason. Um, Hold yeah. on, McDonald's. Right, right. And so, I mean, what was interesting about it, Avery couldn't get the running game going in this one. Now, you didn't have a ton of opportunities, but four carries, negative five yards, no, no real explosive plays for him in this game. And I, I think just shows, like, a reminder, he is a true freshman. There's going to be a little bit of ups and downs. So. And, and and even when Will Howard was in the game too, right? Like in general, the run game was kind of taken away. Three point nine yards of carries, not overly impressive. I mean, Kent State forty six carries, one hundred seventy nine yards. They didn't get two hundred yards, even though they had north of forty carries. It goes to show you, though, Kent State was efficient throwing the ball. Fifteen of seventeen. Avery Johnson five of six. Um, a combined over two hundred yards between them. Right. It goes to show you that teams. We we talked about this. Teams are going to. Are going to sell out. They're going to crowd the line of scrimmage. They're going to take away that running game that's what basically been averaging 250 to 260 yards a game for the better part of a month. Because of that, you are going to have explosives in the passing game available to you. Will Hour connected on the one with Phil Brooks. Is that what he, you saw Houston doing? Were they stacking the box? Because I was wondering about that. I mean, K State, it, it was a bit of a surprise to me. I thought they were okay running it, but I think I would have expected north of five yards per carry the way they had been. No three more on yards of carry. I mean, yeah. that every Johnson um, cut a four carries, negative five yards didn't help. Jace Brown, the Jets weren't as open. Anthony Freya, six carries, 15 yards. I mean, DJ Giddens still did well. He had over seven yards of carry. So did it. And, and then, so I guess you got to pick your spots. Some of it might, might be the, the yardage outside of DJ Giddens, who's north of seven yards of carry, Trajan Ward barely over three yards to carry. That's that's probably what a Will Howard game is probably going to look like more than anything. You, yeah. You think? Yeah. DJ Giddens now over his last two games, 181 yards rushing on 22 carries, which is uh, 8.2 yards per rush. It's kind of interesting how Trey Sean had like a two game stretch where he was averaging like seven and a half yards per carry really had it going. And not that Trey Sean was bad against TCU by any means. He was very effective. Uh, but in this game, he couldn't really get much going on the ground. Ten carries for 32 yards and the one touchdown. So uh, in the longest run of the day, 14 yards by DJ Giddens and then the second longest run by Treshawn Ward, or actually by Will Howard at uh, 11 yards. So didn't get a lot from the QB run game in this one, but they uh, they found a different way to win effectively I, by three I, years. I, yeah, and I know some of it is because Ben Sinnott didn't play a lot. Uh, like Chris Kleiman said, we were smart with him. So it doesn't make me concerned about him. But I'm counting here. There was 21 receptions in the game. Kansas State was 21 to 24, very efficient. Some of it was, there was, I think it was a garbage time reception from Jake Rubley, maybe a couple from Avery. Some of it's Ben Sinnott not playing a ton, but 21 receptions to 11 different players. Phil, Phillip Brooks, yeah, five for 83. Phillip Brooks had a really. Really nice game and made a uh, a tough catch. A nice throw by Will, but a, a good hands, to, really strong hands to pull that one end downfield. 
probably needed to get there a little sooner, but uh, still. Yeah. I, I guess I still. I know Keegan Johnson doesn't play in this game. I, I'm uh, still just not, not in uniform. I think he got banged up a, a, a good bit against TC. Hopefully he's back for Texas. I just have a little bit of concern, DY, still that, I mean, Garrett Oakley le- is second on the team with three catches for 36 yards. Your your third leading receiver is DJ Giddens at two for 25. And your third. And for then, Charles. yeah. Well, yeah. I, in terms of catches, three for 15 for Treshawn Ward. Giddens has two for 25. Will Swanson, one for 21. So you have to go down the list to get to their second receiver behind Brooks. It's Jace Brown with two catches for 13 yards. I mean, is it sustainable? Like, are, are you, you got to get more from the wide receivers, right? I mean, it can't. Phillip Brooks has a great game, but. I don't know. I guess I just have concerns. I have a little bit of concern, D.Y., that like you look at like air yards per pass, right? There were really only two throws that were maybe more than 10 yards in the air, 15 yards in the air. Avery had the one to Will Swanson near the end of the game that was probably over 10 yards in the air. But it was a lot of like check downs, shorter throws out in the yeah. flat. But but you're going to have Ben Sinnott do that. And I think you look. It's not a dynamic receiving core, but if you can get at least one to kind of blow up per game you probably feel because nobody was freaking out when Jace Brown was really ran away with four catches 88 yards and a score and Phil Brooks basically just did the same thing so it it was the same thing as TCU yeah okay well I Garrett Oakley gets a little bit of things going in this one I think yeah uh, I mean, you got 12 personnel maybe that'll work in the future I mean DJ Giddens continues to be pretty both of your running backs are very good in the passing game both your tight ends are pretty good in the passing game you're going to need a receiver or two, but you know, Jace Brown broke out last week. This week it was Phillip Brooks. Look, it is what it is at that position, I think. You, maybe you'd like to see Jay Jackson pop a game here soon, but I, you- I, I think I'm out, and that, this is going to sound bad. I think I don't know that it's wise to have any real expectations for an R.J. Garcia or Keegan Johnson at this point. Well, I was going to I was going to ask you, do, any update on Keegan? Yeah. Well, I no update. I just knew he wasn't going to play. I don't. Yeah, I just didn't know if Chris Kleiman was asked if uh, they thought it was just a one game type. No, you, I don't. That actually never came up. And this is going to sound bad. I just don't know if there's a big difference between can't stay with Keegan or without Keegan to make it really matter right now. The unfortunate reality, D.Y., is the fact that that wasn't asked is probably a sign because they've just gotten so little production from him this year. Unfortunately, that it wasn't a topic. Yeah, and. Look, some of it's probably on him or on the quarterbacks. But man, when Jaden Jackson gets the ball in his hands, he runs as hard as anyone I've seen. So yeah. maybe just trying to get him the ball more so than just the jet screens. I mean, he's turned into a little Malik Knowles light though in those jet screens. He's good at them. I, I agree, DY. I would like to see them get Jaden Jackson involved on some simple short crossing routes where he can just get the ball and run. Or yeah, maybe that the that you know, requires probably really tight man coverage, which I don't know that's how they're playing him. Maybe maybe some bubble screens that they run to Phillip Brooks a lot on the outside, although I'm guessing they do that because maybe Jaden Jackson's one of their better blockers. Yeah, so they mainly... Yeah. And then Jace Brown's, you know, yeah. Then you have your two tiny guys block. But I, but I do echo what you said. Jaden Jackson has been running so incredibly hard and he plays so hard. Like, I, I have appreciation for him. I do too. The pr- the problem that makes it tough right now probably for him is he's like, like the one receiver with a little bit of size left. I mean, Jace Brown's kind of small. Chase J- R.J. Garcia is pretty small. Phil Brooks, pretty small. they all have a lot of size in that group. Keegan Johnson was supposed to supply some of that length, and you know, obviously he's not been there exactly. And, and then one of your first guys off the bench is Seth Porter. Nothing against them, but another small guy. Well, we got to give a shout out to Seth Porter. Uh, Definitely. Uh, he- yeah, first touchdown catch of his career. He waited a long time for that. He's been around the program for six years. He's a leader. He's a captain. Uh, he's a special teams ace on this football team and felt really great to finally get him that first touchdown. Avery Johnson connects with him for a seven-yard touchdown pass at the end of the game. And uh, it was you could see there was some emotion there. Really cool uh, discussion on ESPN about it and his brother Shane Porter uh, kind of hiding the football to to make sure that Seth gets it. So 
an awesome moment. Uh, I know we communicate with Mark, their father, who also played at K-State, just a tremendous K-State family and uh, feel great about that. And actually, we are uh, we're gunning to have Seth on VY this week as part of our player spotlight on uh, 3 Ma. So we'll see if we're able to get Seth Porter on the pod. Want to hear from him because he is a, a special leader in that locker room for Kansas State. Yeah, I wanted to, to pivot back to the defense real quick, D.Y. They've faced, obviously, a couple of backup quarterbacks over the last few weeks, and then Donovan Smith, who's not a backup quarterback by any means. But do you think they can sustain this defensively, or do you think it's more of a byproduct of the teams that they've been playing against? Like, they're, they're going to get tested over the two of the next three games. I mentioned top 15 offenses, and they got Texas this week. I don't know if you had a chance to watch Texas at all against BYU, Malik Murphy, at quarterback. They're going to face another backup, but uh, is it sustainable? Can they can they keep this going, or is it partially a byproduct of the quarterbacks they play? I I think it's naive not to consider it partially a byproduct, although Donovan Smith's good. But then, again, you, you got Houston at the right time, I think, as well. A um, couple games there at home. The Texas Tech second half performance might have been the most impressive, but you shut out you shut out a team or keep two consecutive teams out of the end zone in two consecutive weeks. You're doing something right, but the 1985 Bears wouldn't be able to sustain that. You know, like three points a yeah. game. Come on. So um, to this level, no. But maybe it's not the liability that it once was. Remember the the explosive play was killing this defense. Yeah. Any early thoughts on the Texas game this Saturday? Yeah, I'll coach them. That's that that comes to mind because like Phil Brooks went up and you know it's early in the game and won that one on one matchup like you said for the ball. DJ Giddens winning a lot of his one on one matchups in space. Avery Johnson has of course, but you're you just you're not going to be able to lean or hinge yourself on winning one on one matchups against the talent of Texas, at least offensively for Kansas State. So I think. You got to out-coach them to win. I think that's probably when Texas loses, right? Because, you know, talent's never going to be the problem for them. They get, sometimes they get out-coached or outplayed, you know, effort-wise. So you got to play harder than them and you got to coach better than them because the raw talent is the raw talent. I also think, D.Y., it's, and we talked about this last year going into the Texas game, you have to be sharp in the first quarter defensively especially because Steve Sarkeesian is a good play caller he scripts out that first 15 20 plays and what did they do against K-State last year they went right down and scored their first couple possessions and that K-State was playing catch up the entirety of the game so you got to be ready to go early now they have a freshman quarterback in Malik Murphy that is likely going to be playing and he had around like 170 yards passing against BYU on Saturday two touchdowns I think he had an atrocious interception I mean, D.Y., there was nobody within 10 yards. Like, he's lucky it wasn't a pick six. The guy ran, I think, it all the way down like 15, but there was an illegal block in the back on the return. It was awful. Uh, he had, a, I think, maybe a fumble as well. So he, he's got a big arm. He's not a runner. He's six foot five, 240 pounds. He was a talented recruit out of California. He, he can throw the football, but I think there's some mistakes. I mean, he's a freshman. So redshirt freshman. Um, it'll be... It'll be a matchup to watch, but I mean, you mentioned, I mean, I I think the other big thing with this is Texas leads the Big 12 in yards per carry allowed at 3.2. You know, so you're going to have one of the best rushing offenses in America going up against one of the best rush defenses in the country. Yeah, and they're going to put you in one-on-one opportunities on the outside. I don't know if Kansas State's good enough to win, though. So, I, I, you know, Colin Clyde will figure something out. He's one of the best offensive coordinators in the country for a reason, but I, they're going to have, they're going to be a little mismatched on that side of the ball just because of the strengths and weaknesses just don't align necessarily in Kansas State's favor. The turnover thing is real. I think that's maybe how you can even this thing out a little bit as well. I will also say this. I know, and this is kind of from the naked eye, and I've seen Texas a few times this year, uh, and, and maybe yards per carry will tell me that I'm a little bit of a dummy, but I think Texas is a, now, obviously, less talented in the backfield than they were last year. They had B. John Robinson. And look, there might be something in the ointment because Texas always seems to run the ball so well against Kansas State, at least in this winning streak that they have going. But from a talent standpoint, Texas is a little down in the backfield, in my opinion. 
just a little bit. Now, Brooks is fine, but um, and, and a lot of teams would love to have him. But just from what we're used to seeing from Texas, in terms of raw talent, they're a little bit weaker at running back than they probably are most of their other positions. Yeah, I don't know anyone as dynamic as uh, Bijan Robinson was. And I, I would argue like Roshan Johnson may be better. Jonathan Brooks is putting up really good numbers, but I think Roshan Johnson was probably a more complete back at this point in his career yeah, last year. And I think Jonathan Brooks is probably also on the better side of playing behind the best version of that Texas offensive line. I don't think Bijan and Roshan had this offensive line. Because Texas offensive line is very good. Yeah, they're they're good up front. And uh, last year when they came to Manhattan, they ran the ball for 270 yards on 40 carries and nearly yeah. 7 yards per carry. So you got to take away the run. I mean, that that to me is a key part. If you can, and we'll talk more in depth obviously this week on our pregame pod that'll drop probably around Thursday as usual. But you have to be able to take away the run and force Malik Murphy to drop back and pass the ball in obvious situations and maybe force him into a couple mistakes. Uh, you know, they they ran for over 300 against KU earlier this year and uh they've had games where they run the heck out of the football but i do think like i don't, I don't think jonathan brooks is, he's had some big runs but I, he doesn't strike me as like as explosive yeah and that five-star running back that they thought was going to be special and baxter Andrew baxter they're just no explosiveness he's, he's been he's been disappointing every time he comes in the game and feels like it's a uh, it's a letdown. Yeah, I there's ohio state running backs like nothing gets no chip tree in them and and uh Brian williams like Maybe it's just like my preference, but these plotting running backs anymore, I'm like, give me someone that can get a home run, right? And yeah. the, he reminds me of some of those Ohio State back because Ohio State's had that problem, right? They haven't had an explosiveness in the backfield. That's why they need Travion Henderson. I think Texas needs a fast, explosive running back. I don't know if they have one. Yeah. Well, they're good up front on both sides of football, defensive line too. So K-State's offensive line is going to face a test, but it is a it's a huge matchup. I mean, it's a it's a huge opportunity for K State. Uh, separation Saturday because you got this one, you got Bedlam as well. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It, it, there's three great games in three different time slots Saturday for the Big Twelve. You've got KU at Iowa State at six o'clock. You got Bedlam at two thirty, and you got K State Texas at eleven a.m. And so I think a lot. You're you're right. Separation Saturday because a lot of things are where the direction of this league is headed will be decided on Saturday. Uh, you know. Oklahoma State, I'm now to the point where I would not be surprised at all if they beat Oklahoma. I doubt they, heck, they might be the better team, at least right now. Not really predicated on talent, but how the two are playing. For the listeners to kind of give them an idea of what this picture looks like, it might be important for you to say, like, what, aside from a Kansas State win, of course, and the other two games, what's the best outcome for K-State? I think the best outcome for K-State would be, and and you tell me if you disagree, obviously K-State wins. I think, so I actually think Oklahoma State winning and getting OU at second loss would be, now I have to look at all the tiebreakers, but Oklahoma State's got the head-to-head on K-State. I I like getting OU that second loss. And then I think Iowa State winning would be, so this sounds weird, right? Because Iowa State's only got one league loss, and K State's KU's got two. But KU's schedule at the back end, I think, is easier other than K State. I mean, K State's their last hard hard game remaining on their schedule for KU after they get past Iowa State. So I think KU losing, Iowa State winning that game is better because K State gets Iowa State and Manhattan, and I think K State will win that game and be able to hand. And Iowa State's still got to play Texas in Ames as well. So uh, that that's the game I would go back and forth on. I think uh, actually, I mean, you tell me what do you think is the best outcomes for K State? Do you think it's Oklahoma State losing or winning, and then do you think KU or Iowa State? I almost think it's Oklahoma State losing, uh, just because like if they beat Oklahoma, I don't know if they lose again. Like, well, that's a, so that's where I go with that. Dy is like, I don't think they lose again if they win, right? Yeah, yeah. But if if they lose, they still have the tie. If K State drops one more game, yeah, but they have the tiebreaker. The might be, they're in trouble no matter what. You do see. I could still see a path at seven and two overall. Yeah, but then it gets into the complicated tiebreakers. And look, for me, it's you need the team to lose that probably has the easiest path, even in a tiebreaker scenario that you're outlining. 
Like you don't want Oklahoma State to just have one loss. I, I think you need to muddy it up even a little bit more than that. Oklahoma State, like they have to really screw up to lose again. Like if they were, I mean, after the after bedlam, look the, and the Sooners. To be honest, like I think Oklahoma could still lose again. I don't know if Oklahoma State could. I don't know. Oklahoma's schedule sucks. So oh, let's see. Oh, I know, but they just. Like in a game where, if you look at the metrics, and I saw, you know, the stats were put it out today. Like, did you really lose this bad? You know that graph that he always has. Like Oklahoma dominated, KU and still lost. And the week before, they 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 escaped UCF. I just don't know Oklahoma's disciplined enough to to remain and skate. Yeah, no, I don't. Uh, I guess we'll I, see. I, in a, in a way, I think we're we're still getting last year's Oklahoma a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it'll be a fun Saturday, hopefully. Got the Patrick Gongbeck commitment, too, so we'll see what comes of that. And uh, then K-State basketball kicking off. We got K-State basketball exhibition against Emporia State on Wednesday night as well. How do, you, how do you think it would shape out? Like, do you think KU beats Iowa State? It's, what, a one-point spread? Yeah. I mean, I'm just trying to, like, which of these teams are kind of like, pretenderish to you and which ones are like okay they're legit because Iowa State KU game is like it's interesting because you wouldn't expect either of those to be here especially with the way the Jayhawks started to trend and now they maybe they got it figured out I just were I still worry about Jason Bean like look he's a fine quarterback you look at the numbers and they're not bad but like everybody knows if he tried to do it against Oklahoma you know late in the game he's trying to find ways to lose every time yeah. Um, For two picks and still found a way to win. There's two bad picks at the end. Yeah, which, I mean, Brent Venables coached like a moron at the end of that game, and Jeff Levy, like it was... You, 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 like they, they conservatively ran the ball to just burn KU's three timeouts as if two minutes wouldn't be plenty of time for KU to be able to go down and get a field goal at best to win the game. With In this era of college football... um Two minutes, that's plenty of time, and and they couldn't get anything going on that last drive after that one interception to put the game away. So, I don't know. The game is in Ames. It's a night kick to, I think Iowa State has some crazy record in night games in Ames. Going into last year, I remember the K-State game, like that record was talked about. Like, they're great at night, and Jack Trice. So, won 10-9 to in Ames at night last year. That gets really hard to handicap. Yeah. I, I would probably give a slight lean to Iowa State because they're at home. But I think it's going to be a great night. I will say, like, maybe I would pick that way too just because, like, I just don't trust Jason Bean in the most pivotal of moments. And you know that game is probably going to be close. So that's where I come out. Bedlam, whew, Sooners have dominated this here. It just flat out dominated. The games aren't even close most of the time. But those two teams couldn't be going in a different direction right now. Yeah. Oh, man. Well, it's going to be a separation Saturday and an anxiety Saturday. Be why. Well, maybe not anxiety once you get past your game. Cause, well, cause yeah. I don't, because like we said, we don't even know which outcomes are actually ideal. Yeah. No, <laughs> KSA wins. I, you know, I'll just kick back and enjoy college football and either outcome for both could, could work out. Um, in a beneficial way for K State, so yeah. it's a uh, hey. Look, shout out to KU for the win over OU, and uh, let's do everything I we can to keep that. OU and Texas out of the league title. That's kind of where I'm at with like Oklahoma State beating OU. D wise, you get them a second loss. If K State could beat Texas, like it could, yeah. it could be hard for those two to get into the league title. And as much as I talk, you know, shit on KU, I'll say this: where where Lance Leipold has taken them from where they were in in a pretty short amount of time, it's just night and day. So. You know, we can say that, man, we're not sure they're, they're here yet, right? Because I'm still kind of there. But boy, just being here is remarkable. And I don't know that there's many other coaches that could have done what he's done. Yeah. No, he's uh, he's done an incredible job. And um, I mean, it was even more impressive because like that, the atmosphere, I mean, it looked good at kick, but it, yeah. the half that stadium was gone after an hour delay. I, I, I can't believe that. That's that's a bad look that you don't stick around in a little bit of rain against a top ten team when you're winning. So I, I could not believe how much that crowd dissipated in a huge game for KU. But you know, that's a heck of a win for that program. 
So, yeah. And uh, let's keep OU and Texas out of the league title. So, sounds great. Hey, that's on the table now. A couple of weeks ago, they didn't look realistic at all. Yeah. So, all right. Well, uh, we will talk more in depth uh, later this week about the Texas game and this weekend when we get John Kurtz back and we do our traditional pregame show. So, looking forward to it. Appreciate all of you. Appreciate DY for jumping on once again and appreciate Nick Springer behind the scenes for producing the pod. We'll also get a pod out for Curry Sexton this week. And I mentioned we hope to have a player spotlight pod with Seth Porter this week as well. So appreciate all of you listening to Three Maw. And uh, as always, subscribe, like, rate us, uh, leave a comment on YouTube if you wish. Uh, we appreciate your support. We appreciate the support of Holiday Distillery and 360 Vodka. Go get your Ben Holiday bottled in Bond Bourbon and your, your 360 vodka as you stock up for the rest of the season and appreciate our friends at Home Field Apparel. Thank you for listening to another episode of Three Ma.